Good morning. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme this morning, a God idea, a God idea. I am so grateful for vacations. I have always stressed to all of my working folks and leaders, one needs time to unwind, time to relax, and time to rest deeply. It is of paramount importance for the work that we are called to do. And I did it. And it makes me even more prepared and ready and full of energy to journey with you, this congregation, United. I'm grateful to the leadership here at United that makes it possible for me to go on vacation where people are willing to care and rise up to the task in my absence. Two more years and I'm actually eligible for sabbatical, but let's not go there today. <laughs> I am back. <laughs> and while I took vacation from the church, I did not take vacation from the news. In my time away, we've had natural catastrophes, especially all of the flooding that happened on the East Coast that caused people to have to evacuate their homes and to change their lives or have their lives erupted in such a way. Also, the United States, after being in Afghanistan for 20 years, announced that it would pull out and be out by the end of August. And this week, yesterday, is the 20th anniversary of 9-11. This year, for some reason, perhaps because I am now a BBC listener, I'm sobering up to the fact that 20 years ago, extremists got on nine planes with the sole purpose of attacking America. Three planes were successful. The violence that happened on those planes is not talked about, but can re be read in reports that were provided. The planes were not just handed over, and then there was this fourth plane. This plane was already 45 minutes late, and in the time that they were 45 minutes late, the people on that plane had learned had, about what had already happened. This plane was supposed to be headed to San Francisco. There were four hijackers on this plane. The fifth had been held up, whereas on the other plane, there had been five hijackers. People on this plane prepared and worked together to bring the plane down. This plane, they suspect, was headed to DC. How many more lives would have been taken? But the passengers on this plane said, not today, and fought to take that plane down. The plane crashed in Pennsylvania at 593 miles per hour. This day, 9-11 changed our lives forever. Many people say they can say before 9-11 and after 9-11. The country with the largest military, that had the largest military budget in the world and lives across the waters, got attacked. This attack resulted in 2,977 fatalities and over 25,000 injuries and substantial long-term health consequences. In addition, at least 10 billion infrastructure dollars and property damage was done. It remains to this day one of the deadliest terrorist attacks in human history. Now, honestly, there is so much that could be said about the date, including why were we intact in the first place? Why do other countries hate America? Or the code violations that exactly existed with the World Trade Center that led to 1,000 people not being able to get out? Or the ways in which our country responded that just ended in a 20-year occupation of Afghanistan that within days of our announcement led to the Taliban taking right back over again. Did you see those fireworks on the day that the last plane left out of Afghanistan? But I don't want to take any of those roads today. I want to focus on the more personal and how it impacted the everyday person how so many on that day looked for loved ones, how on that day so many people were drastic and scared about what had happened to their loved ones that were around the building that they couldn't make contact with. For some, they searched and they searched and it ended in good news, but for others, that day ended in permanent disappearance of loved ones whose bodies they never regained. 
The pain on that day was felt by every American. We were in shock and we were in pain. Pain and shock as we came to grips with so many people dead. When it's all said and done, we are humans, and as humans, we're quite fragile. We like to act like we got it together and we're tough, but really, at the end of the day, we're fragile. And Paul got that right in Corinthians, that we are fragile, fragile cracked earthen vessels. Bush reported struggling with his own anger after 9-11. We wanted vengeance, we wanted payback, because that's what we do well as Americans. We wanted war and we wanted death. But as a country, we were hurting. The real heroes were on that fourth plane, and the civilians that came to rescue others, and the firefighters, and the names we will never know. But the pain is there, gut-riching pain, as we watch day after day families crippled by the fact that their loved ones were gone forever and how they died. As we learn names of people on planes, first responders, workers in the World Trade Center who were now dead. That day was hard and the days that follow and the cast of debris was nothing compared to the heaviness and pain that lingered in our midst. A couple of years later, I visited the World Trade Center myself and it was sobering. Nothing was there. We dress ourselves up and we look real good and we act like we're so together. But 911 ripped all of our pretentiousness away. It laid bare our humanity and our culpabilities. It made it clear that in the end, what is most dear is human life. All we have beyond and besides our faith is each other. These bonds are important. These connections are real. And when life is laced with tragedy, we hold on to each other. This is where we enter the biblical text this morning. I have always liked Peter because in his wrongness, he has a genuine desire to be totally dedicated to God. Jesus is talking with the disciples, and he's back on this thing about leaving. But this time, it's more serious, and it's closer Jesus is alerting the disciples to the fact he will not be with them too much longer. And he's really real. And I'm going to die a violent death, he alerts them. It will not be a pretty death, but I am going to rise again. And Peter is not having any of it. I love you. I have walked with you. You are my connection to what's real. I have learned so much from you. We are doing great things. People are believing. We are a community. You are my family. You said whoever wanted to follow you had to turn away from their family and give all that up, and I did it. Imagine all of what we've got going on. Peter was, a, was like, I ain't letting you go, Jesus. He didn't want to hear it, just as we don't want to hear what we perceive as bad news. Death isn't one of our favorite topics. We don't like to talk about it, and it's hard to let folks go, especially when they mean so much to us. And Peter was struggling. I'm not only not understanding what you are saying, Jesus, but I don't want to understand you. I don't want to understand this foolishness that is coming out of your knife. You are not going anywhere. And for just one moment, I think we can relate to it. Peter had a no in his spirit, but he also had no choice. He had no input, but he did have his feelings and his love, and he operated from that space. Jesus, you can't leave us. You, you can't leave us. Not now, you, you can't go. No, no, I'm not hearing it. And then Jesus does that thing that snaps you out of yourself. He responds harshly, but truthfully, my journey has always been the same. I was always on a mission. I did not come here to stay. I imagine what's missing from this text is Jesus' understanding of where Peter was coming from, his understanding that Peter was holding on, because really that's what we do as humans. We hold on to each other. And when we think maybe someone is not going to be with us, we hold on to them even more dearer. 
And when they leave, we hold on to the ones that are left behind. Death does that to us. It stirs us up and brings all kinds of feelings out of us. And I imagine Jesus knew all of this, but what Mark gives us is Jesus saying, Peter, Peter, get out of yourself. You're all in your feelings. You are focused on you, but I am focused on divine things. My purpose is so much bigger than just you or the disciples or even those who are following us. Divine things, divine acts. What a body slam. What a body slam of truth. Oftentimes, our decisions, our actions, our living is based on just us. It's all about how we feel or don't feel. It's about whether our feelings got hurt or they didn't. It's a short circumference of vision. It's about our church and our groups. It's about our cliques. It's about our family and our existence. I mean, we're fragile after all. And sometimes our vision as humans is limited, but Jesus deposits this notion of a longer vision and operating of, of something other than out of our own humanness a focus toward the divine, allowing Pentecost, the Spirit of God, to guide us and give us the vision we don't have in ourselves. I saw this quote yesterday and it stuck to me, if you cannot sing, be the song. Be the song. This push toward divine things is being the song. Get out of yourself, see the bigger picture, or just let the Spirit lead you. Whatever I got to go, and whether you deal or do not deal with it, it this thing is going to happen. Sometimes I imagine that God whispers in our ears that God, what God wants us to do. Is that God whispering? <laughs> Put some words to it, Lord. <laughs> there are good ideas and there are great ideas. And some of you have had some great ideas. And then there's a God idea. So many times in the biblical text, I feel like God is whispering in Jesus' ear, say and do this. He knew his own death would be hard for his disciples to hear, but he whispers it to them anyway, planting a seed like God does with us. Sometimes the answer in the path we are seeking is not within us, but we need God's intervention and God's whisper and God's spirit to show us the way. I was talking with Alderman Sophia King yesterday and we were saying, wow, we don't have the answers to the violence in our city or what is happening on our lawn or the drug dealers or the selling of drugs. But we can sit in this hard space and we can listen to one another and we can talk about it and we can pray about it and we can continue to invite our community in and struggle and we can have faith that God will whisper in our ears. Maybe God already has. And isn't it wonderful when we can hear and respond to God's whisper? Well, let me tell you what happened to Tara when God whispered in Tara's ear. Tara's Nana was in hospice at 103 years old and was asked by the staff, what were her goals now that she was in hospice? What goals, what did she have on her bucket list at 103 years old that she wanted? And Nana responded without a blink, I wanna attend my granddaughter Tara's wedding. Well, the doctor told her flying was maybe not a good idea. Let's not even talk about a great idea or a God idea. And that they didn't think that her heart would hold out. Nana was hanging on and trying to figure out how she could go to her granddaughter's wedding. Well, about that time, God whispered in Tara's ear and Tara bought a ticket and flew out with her makeup artist and her photographer and her not yet done wedding dress. She didn't tell anyone, not her fiance, not her family. She just wanted to get out there to her Nana because she wanted her Nana to be able to go to her wedding. Tara says, words cannot explain how much these moments mean to me, and I will cherish these memories for the rest of my life. Nana's smile and Nana's laugh are forever etched in my mind, and the love between us will live in my heart. 
when she put on that beautiful wedding gown and she put up all makeup and her and Nana spent moments together enjoying her wedding. This was one of the greatest days of my life, says Tara. When she got back to her wedding, she put up beautiful pictures of her Nana at her wedding. She says, I said goodbye to Nana that, way, that night. And 27 days later, Nana went to be with the Lord. But before she did, she grabbed Tara's cheeks and her hands. And she looked straight into her eyes. And she said, I love you. I love you so much. Tara says, I was blessed to have this to be my last memory. My last memory with my grandmother. She was beyond amazing. She was such an amazing Christian. I love you, Nana, always and forever. Maya Angelou said, when folks leave us, you don't remember much of what they said, even though we do a lot of talking. You remember how people make you feel. I imagine it's true of the Nanas of the world. For every one of us who've had that special grandmother, we know it is true. I imagine it's true of 9-11 victims. And it's true of all the people who rose up to help others in painful times. And it's true of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I know he picked many of us up out of the valley and turned us around and brushed us off and gave us purpose. And I am so glad that he did. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Jesus is the center of my joy. He went to the valley to get some of us. He went to the far fetches to get some of us. Even one was not too little for him to go out of his way to get. And some of us were out there and Jesus issued grace. We're not too good at that grace thing, but Jesus issued grace. We forget that sometimes. And Jesus issued mercy. And Jesus said, he who is without sin, speak up or let others go. May we live our lives like Nana. May we live our lives like Jesus. May we live our lives in such a way like Jesus that we do not lower ourselves, but we upgrade ourselves to divine things, not human things. May we live our lives in such a way that you open yourself up to hearing that whisper from God, that God idea. May we live our lives in such a way that when we are warm, when we are gone, we give people something to talk about for centuries and centuries. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, for many we remember 9-11, but Lord help us to not only remember 9-11, but to remember that you call us to a greater life. You call us to operate, you call us to be your hands and your feet in the world. Lord whisper to us and help us to hear you and help us not only to have good and great ideas, but help us every now and then to hear you and to have a God idea. In Jesus' name, amen.